Okay, so it is Wednesday today. Um, Monday we talked about so the birth of plate tectonics. We talked about continental drift and this crazy <coughs> idea that the continents could have been moving around over Earth history. And then we found from sort of new advances in technology in the last hundred years or so, we found evidence that that indeed happened. In particular, we had evidence from the paleomagnetic record, um, things like the seafloor spreading the stripes in the seafloor, sort of nice and, and uh, symmetrical around the mid-ocean ridges. And also the fact that we actually surveyed the seafloor and we could see that there were things like mid-ocean ridges. Um, and all of these things helped us form these, this idea of uh, the plate tectonic theory. And today we're going to start narrowing it down a bit and actually think about the different processes happening at those different plate boundaries and how they create the different features in the landscape that we see and what's sort of going on, what's sort of associated with those. But before we do that, I had a request, a very quick request to go through question five from quiz one which was everybody's favorites. People did really well on this, by the way. I was impressed. Um, so if you can vaguely read my scrolling writing, you can see that we had the two boxes. We had atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, levels, and then we had the amount of plant growth. And my little description was saying, well, if we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, because it's a really low percentage right now of what's in the atmosphere, and so plants struggle to select it out of the atmosphere, and they use that carbon dioxide to, to, for photosynthesis to grow. So if we increase the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere, if we increase this, then it's going to make it easier for plants to take in that carbon dioxide and therefore grow. So we're going to get more plant growth because it's easier for them to take in carbon dioxide. It's, sort of, it's called carbon dioxide fertilization. So what sort of arrow do I draw between those? Is it going to be a normal arrow or an arrow with a circle in the end? Normal, absolutely. So between these two at first, we have a nice normal arrow. But we have a second part of this process, which is if we have a lot more plant growth and they're taking in carbon dioxide, what's going to happen to the amount in the atmosphere? It's going to go down. If we're going to have more plants absorbing more CO2, then we're actually going to have, this is an increase leading to a decrease. So what sort of arrow are we going to have? With the circle on the end, absolutely. So going back in this direction, we have our arrow with the circle. So we have a closed loop. That's always something to check. You can see that it goes around in a loop. And that's our negative feedback process. The fact that we have an initial increase, if we follow our loop around, it leads to a decrease again. Okay, so hopefully for those of you that, that found that a little bit tricky, that will make more sense now. Okay, so let's think about our theory of plate tectonics. This is where we got to on Monday. And um, we got to this idea that it, the, the Earth's surface behaves a bit like ice in a pond. And I know that's a useless analogy for everyone who lives in South California, but you've all at least seen pictures of ice on a pond and it breaks apart and you get activity and movement along those little breaks. And so that, that idea that the Earth's lithosphere, which remember is that brittle outer part, which consists of both the crust and the top part of the mantle, is broken into a dozen or so plates and they move relative to one another on top of that asthenosphere, which is that hotter part underneath, which when you sort of put force on it will actually flow still solid, but it will flow, okay? And so you can see a number of the different plates there. But what is it that actually drives plate tectonics? We have these sort of bits that are broken apart, but what is it that actually causes them to move? And it's actually the heat from the interior of the Earth. So why is the interior of the Earth hot? Why is it hotter than the outside? something we accept, but why? Stunned silence. Okay, do you remember when we talked about how the planets formed, we said that they had these huge collisions that released a lot of energy. We turned that kinetic energy, that energy of movement, 
into heat when those collisions occurred, and that melted good sort of parts of the Earth. Not only that, but in the Earth, we have a lot of radioactive elements. And you know from, as we get energy from it, that when radioactive elements decay, they produce heat. And when all of those elements are in the center of the Earth, there's nowhere for that heat to go. It collects. And ever so gradually, it makes its way out, okay? which is why as we go deeper and deeper and deeper, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay? So that, that heat from radioactive elements and left over from the formation of the Earth is what is making the interior of the Earth so hot. And then as we move towards the outside, it gets cooler. Okay? And we need to talk about heat transfer. So we talked a lot last week about radiation. And radiation is the movement of energy between two points that doesn't require matter to be involved in any way. And so what type or what was my example for radiation? Why is radiation important for the Earth? Come on, wake up. You can do this. Where are we getting radiation from? The sun. Okay, we were talking about Earth's temperature and the fact that we get energy from the sun. And it, to, in order to arrive at the Earth, it has to travel through space. And space is a vacuum, more or less. Okay? And so in order to get that energy to travel to the Earth, that's the process of radiation. It doesn't need anything in, in between. But we also have these two other ways of transferring heat. And you're familiar with them because everyone, hopefully, by now, has boiled a pan of water at some point in their life. Okay? Um, and you know that even if, you hold, if, if that handle wasn't wood, if it was metal, after a certain amount of time, even though it's not immediately above the flame, it will feel hot, right? You won't want to touch it particularly because it will be hot. And that's because of conduction. Conduction is heat transfer through a solid. And obviously, while your pan is on the, the, the flame there, the solid part of your pan is not moving around. You're not getting movement of the pan. It's just the heat is traveling by sort of the deep down or down by the flame. Those molecules are getting hotter and vibrating more, and those vibrations cause the ones next to them to vibrate more. And so that's the process of conduction. Convection is actually what the water does in the middle. And you know that you see bubbles rising, and then you get sort of it, this, the water spreads out, and then it will sink back down. And this is what we call convection. So in convection, actually the substance itself is moving and taking that heat along with it. So in our example, we have that hot water. The water is being heated at the base of the plan. It, get, it expands a little bit, so it gets less dense, and that means that it rises, just like a hot air balloon will rise, that hot, hot air, uh, water will rise, but as it moves away from that source of heat, it will cool down a little bit. And so it spreads out and cools down, and then when it cools down, it becomes denser again, so it sinks at the sides. So we have these convection currents going on. So, which of those three do you think is most important for driving plate tectonics? What do you think is happening in the center of the Earth? Well, not in the very center, but in the interior of the Earth. Few more seconds. Okay, let's take a look. See if we agree. Convection. We got 57%, which is at least a majority. Convection is the most important one. Okay. So remember that you might think it's conduction, and definitely for the outermost part of the Earth, through the lithosphere. Conduction is most important because those plates are rigid, they're solid, they're not moving. But actually, do you remember we said that just like I had that plasticine and I could pull it, it will flow that asthenosphere underneath. And so that's what happens. In the mantle, we have convection going on. We have uh, parts of the mantle deep down near the inner core 
they heat up, or sorry, the outer core, they heat up, they become less dense, and so they start rising. And then as they move away and towards the surface of the Earth, they cool down a little bit, and then they spread out, and then eventually they'll sink back down. Okay? So convection drives plate tectonics. But how? And to be honest with you, this is something that we still don't have that great a sense of. We don't necessarily have an answer for this yet. It's probably some combination of these. So the traditional idea was we had these convection currents, and as that hot material rose and then spreads out to the side, that spreading out to the side pulls the overlying plates along with it. And it's a nice idea, but it's really difficult to think about how the physics of that will work. It really shouldn't pull the plates as fast as it does. So, how about our second one, which is that movement and, and that subduction, so that sort of ocean crust sliding back down into the mantle, basically pulls the rest of the, the slab with it. Okay, so that sinking downwards is pulling the plates along. Um, and then we also have the idea that at a ridge, it's sort of higher than further away from the ridge. And so maybe it's just that, that sort of force of magma moving up, sort of pushes up the crust a little bit. And maybe it's just the sheer weight of the, the crust and the plate at that point that forces it to slide down slope. Okay. So some or at least one of these must be driving that process of plate tectonics. And we're still interested in finding out more about that process. But convection is the key. OK, so how are the, our plate boundaries defined? Well, I've shown you this map before, so it's not a surprise to anyone. But they are where most of the earthquakes and volcanoes are. So here's a map with those plate boundaries marked on it. And all of those little blue dots and green dots and red dots are earthquakes. And you can see that those earthquakes tend to follow the plate boundaries, which is not surprising because earthquakes happen when rocks break. And that's going to happen much more where we have plates sliding past each other. And if you look at volcanoes as well, we tend to see that volcanic activity tends to occur along little narrow boundaries associated with these plates as well. Okay, so if we look at things like volcanoes and earthquakes, they really nicely outline for us the plate boundaries. OK, so here's a little map. And here's a question for you. So here in Irvine, which tectonic plate are we on? Are we on the North American plate, the Pacific plate, the Cocos plate, or the Caribbean plate? OK, I think we've got everyone. So let's see if I've caught you out. Oh, I did. Hurrah. OK, so. 52% of people said we're on the North American plate. You would be wrong. OK. Because what do we cross if we drive inland for an hour or so? The San Andreas Fault. OK. And so we're actually on the Pacific plate. And the San Andreas Fault marks the boundary between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. San Francisco is on the North American plate. And we're ever so slowly sliding up the coast to meet them. So if you come back in five million years or more, then uh, that long drive through the Central Valley won't be necessary anymore because we'll be right next to them. OK? So we're on the, the Pacific plate. So let's think about what type of plate boundaries we have. OK? So a couple of these are obvious, and the third one not so much. So what do you think happens at divergent boundaries? Think about divergent boundaries. What's happening there? You can do it with your hands if you want. That's it. We're diverging. They're moving apart. We have plates moving apart at divergent boundaries. What do you think happens at convergent boundaries? Plates are moving together. Really complicated stuff. OK, what do you think happens at transform faults? We've got it at the front. Absolutely, they just slide past each other. OK? So really, that's sort of the fundamental. So transform faults is where the plates just slide past each other. 
When we have divergent, where the plates are moving away from each other, and convergent, where they're moving towards each other. But we have another little complication to add, which is if we want to understand the sort of the landscape features and the processes happening at each of these different boundaries, we also need to think about what type of crust is involved. Because we have two types of crust. We have oceanic crust and continental crust. And they both have slight differences in the composition, and so the density and things like that. So let's take a look at our different types of crust. If we look at continental crust, it tends to be really much thicker. So it can be sort of tens of kilometers thick. Probably the thickest is about 70 kilometers. And it's less dense material. So things like granite, if you ever have granite countertops or things like that in your kitchen, that's sort of the average composition of continental crust. And the thing about continental crust is that it's, it's uh, so light, it's not dense enough, and so it cannot be subducted back down into the mantle. Okay. Then we have oceanic crust, and that's thinner. It's usually less than 10 kilometers thick. It's much more dense. If you've heard of basalt, if you've ever been to Hawaii and seen the rocks that are there, that's sort of the equivalent of basalt, that dark rock. And this is dense enough that it can be subducted back into the mantle, so it can head back down at those sort of convergent boundaries. Okay? Frantic typing. So my question for you is, having just told you that, thinking logically about it, what do you think has happened to the volume of continental crust over the 4.5 billion years of Earth history? Do you think it's decreased? Do you think it stayed about the same? Or do you think it's increased through time? So think about what I just told you. A few more seconds. OK. <laughs> We're getting some good splits today. So this is more or less as even as I've ever seen it before in my life. Let's go back a slide. What do I say about continental crust that's important for this question? It cannot be subducted back into the mantle. Does this change your answer? <laughs> OK, I'm going to ask one more time. Having just told you that, I'm basically giving you the answer. So if it cannot be subducted back into the mantle, what's going to happen through time? Think about how we make granite and things like that as well. Few more seconds. Okay. Let's take a look and see if we have a little bit more of an answer. There's a shift, enough of a shift, I'm happy. Yes, the continental area will likely have increased through Earth's history. Because every year we create a little bit sort of, of continental crust through volcanic activity, things like that. Um, but once we've created that continental crust, it's, it's really very difficult for us to get that back into the mantle. It just sort of collects on the surface. So while we can subduct oceanic crust, so if we look around the world oceans, it's very difficult to find older oceanic crust than a few hundred million years because it recycles back down. We can go and we can find areas of continents that were around 3.5 billion years ago. Okay? So the amount of continental crust has probably been growing ever so slightly through Earth's history. OK, so continental crust is therefore generally older. It tends to accrete through time, so sort of gather through time. And then that oceanic crust is generally younger, and it's constantly getting destroyed and recycled into the mantle um, at our convergent boundaries. OK, so in your notes, if you have the printout of this, great. If you have it on the computer, great. If not. Draw this table very quickly into your 
notes. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six columns. And I have A, B, C, D, E, F. And then I want you to think about type of boundary, type of crust, landscape features. So I mean, what sort of things would you see if you looked at a map? OK? Volcanoes, question mark. And then earthquakes, thinking about whether earthquakes would be shallow or both shallow and deep. And I'll give you a minute or so just to copy down those columns. OK, I think most people have got there, or at least have a neighbor that can help them finish. OK, so here is my A, B, C, D, E, F. These are from your textbook. Um, and they show you different types of plate boundary. So for each of these, I want you to think about those six columns. So first of all, what type of boundary is it? Is it transform fault? Is it convergent, divergent? What type of crust is involved? Is it ocean? Is it continental? Is it both? Then think about landscape features. If you were to look at this boundary on a map, what would you see that would be diagnostic of this particular boundary? And then I want you to think about whether volcanoes would occur, and also think about earthquakes. So all of these boundaries, you would get earthquakes. But thinking about what's happening and what you can see on there, do you think those would be shallow, or do you think you could get both shallow and deep earthquakes? And I have one little change to make. I'm not a big fan of these diagrams. I know that they wanted to simplify things, but I think they went a little bit too far. So I want you to take a quick look. And I have a, thing, a couple of things to add, which is that as this this uh, sort of plate here is sinking back down into the mantle, what do you think happens? Does it just sink back down and that's it? What do you think might happen to it? It melts a little bit. It's actually not the plate itself, but water squeezed out of that makes everything melt a little bit more easily. And so the reason that we have our mountains here is because we have melt collecting here really high tech stuff here, and then some of it moves up, and we get volcanoes. OK, can't see terribly well. So get magma moving up, and this, this line of mountains here is actually volcanoes. And the same thing happens here, and this is the diagram I really disagree with, because we also get melt happening down here as this plate subducts back into the mantle. And so we also have magma moving to the surface. And what we actually create is a little chain of islands, OK? A little chain of volcanic islands sort of all along that boundary, OK? You can tell now why I use PowerPoint rather than try and draw things, because I can't draw. But does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? OK, so see if you can fill in your table using these or the ones in your notes. And then I'll give you maybe three minutes. The TAs are around. So if you wave at me, TAs. There's one, two. So they'll come around as well and help you out. So if you get started on that, and we'll come back together and think about it in a couple of minutes. So I, ha I had a quick question about landscape features. When I mean what I mean by landscape features is, are there mountains? Are there islands? Is there a trench? Is there a valley? Is there a, sort of a, a ridge? Something like that. So how would we recognize it if we looked at it on a map? OK? OK, so a lot of people I've spoken to are more or less done at this point. So let's start walking through some of these examples. And you can give me your answers. The purpose of this is that I can show you the diagram. And you can go, OK, it's a diagram. And then you move on and you don't think about what makes that particular boundary different. So that's the purpose of this exercise. So looking at A, what type of boundary is this? Transform, absolutely. What type of crust is this? Continental, absolutely. Um, and so what sort of landscape features might we see? Faults, definitely. We can see the big San Andreas fault running through. And in particular, what does that fault often do to things like rivers or mountain ranges or something like that? Yeah, it sort of creates an offset, right? 
if you have a nice line of mountains and you have a fault running through the middle, it might not be a nice line in a few million years. It might have one bit and then another bit over here. So we get this offset going on. Do you think we have volcanoes here? No, because we're not creating anything new, we're not destroying anything, it's just sliding past each other. Do you think we have earthquakes here? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And what do you think? Do you think they're mainly shallow, or do you think that they could be both? <laughs> this one was a tricky one, um, but actually they're mainly shallow. The earthquakes that we get around, uh, around here are mainly shallow. Okay, so we've got the idea now, so let's look at B. What type of boundary is B? Divergent. What sort of crust is this? Continent. Continent, absolutely. What sort of landscape features might you see? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're talking about a ridge, right? So just like the, the mid-ocean ridges, we can have ridges on land as well. So there would be sort of a, an elevated area of land in a ridge type shape. And what do we get in the very middle of that ridge? A little valley. You heard of a rift valley? That's a rift valley, okay? And so we have this ridge where we have magma rising up underneath, which forces the land upwards. But where it's being pulled apart in the middle, we have a little bit of a valley where it's getting pulled apart. Do you think we have volcanoes here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, because we have magma rising up. And we're creating new crust, and so we definitely have volcanoes here. Um, do you think we have earthquakes here? Yeah? Do you think they're going to be shallow or deep? Yeah? Be confident. Shallow. Absolutely shallow because we don't really have activity happening deeper down. Everything's happening near the surface here. Okay, so C should be easy. What type of boundary is C? Divergent. What type of crust is C? Oceanic. What type of landscape feature would you see? It's basically the same as what we have in B, but it's underwater. So it's still a ridge, it's our mid-ocean ridge, and we still have a little valley in the center of that, okay? So it's our mid-ocean ridge, and therefore we also get volcanic activity. Remember those hydrothermal vents I was talking about? They line up along this type of uh, ridge. And we also get those shallow earthquakes close to the surface. Okay. So let's talk about some more interesting ones. What is happening at D? Are we diverging, converging, or transforming? Converging. Convergent, absolutely. It's a convergent boundary. Things are coming together. What type of crust is involved here? Continental. Continental. What sort of landscape features do we see? Mountains. We get mountain ranges. This is how we build our mountains. So wherever you see mountains, we, we've got convergence going on. So, do you think we have volcanoes here? It's more difficult to say. We do actually have a few volcanoes. It's not as much as uh, some of these others, but we do have volcanoes here. What about earthquakes? Yes, and do you think they're shallow or deep or both? Both, in this case, they'd be both shallow and deep because we're creating big thicknesses and we're squashing that crust together. Because what's happening here is, that remember, that continental crust is too light. It won't subduct. So what it does is it just collects on the surface, and we mash it together, and that's how we build our mountain ranges. So what happens at E? Are we converging or diverging? Converging. And what type of crust do we have here? Both. We have both oceanic and continental. And so what sort of landscape features do you see? Everyone's wound down all of a sudden. What type of landscape features do we see? We see a mountain. We see a line of mountains. In particular, we see a line of volcanoes. Okay. Um, and what else is in front of those volcanoes? A trench, an ocean trench. So where those two plates meet and one starts sliding underneath the other, we get a really deep area of the ocean. And we call that an ocean trench. 
So where we see that ocean trench next to a nice line of volcanoes, it should be a nice obvious sign to us that we've got this convergent boundary going on. And then F, what type of boundary is this? Convergent, what type of crust is this? Oceanic. Um, what type of landscape features do we get? Yep, we get a trench again, and we get a line of volcanic islands. It's called a volcanic arc. And for both of these, we obviously have volcanoes, but do we get earthquakes, do you think? Yes. Yes, and do you think they're going to be shallow or deep or both? Deep. Deep. They're actually going to be both again. Okay, because at that point where the plates meet, we get earthquakes, but also as that plate subducts down, it also gets deeper. Okay, so those are the differences between everything. It's worth having a look at it. So I've got my little table in there for your notes after as well. So let's have a, a little look at some examples of these boundaries. So here is a, a good example of a transform, transform fault. And quite often we get transform faults between segments of the mid-ocean ridges. Okay, so here you can see that that orange line running up the, the page, that's actually our mid-ocean ridge there. But you can see that then there's this sort of sideways movement. That's our transform margin. And then the trench, or the, sorry, the ridge continues up there. So you can see our features are offset. It's a transform margin. And here's our favorite, the San Andreas Fault. And this is us on the Pacific side. And then inland and up near San Francisco, they're more on the, the North American plate. Okay? And so we're moving past each other, and we're slowly sliding up the coast of North America. So where are the transform faults? Well, I just told you the San Andreas, so that's a nice, easy one. But if we're looking, uh, if we're looking at a map, some of the easiest ones to see are in the ocean. So here would be a good example. You can see that that mid-ocean ridge is offset by, from itself. Okay? And that boundary in between there is a transform boundary. Okay. So here we have our divergent plate margins. And in the boxes I showed you before that you looked at, we just looked at continental versus ocean. Okay? But really, all of these boundaries start off as continental ones, and this is actually how we, we sort of form a new ocean. It's because we start rifting apart the continent, and over time, we get this sort of rift valley forming, and then eventually, that, that sort of area of land becomes so low that it gets flooded by the sea, and eventually, there's no more continental crust left to pull apart, and we start forming ocean crust in between at our mid-ocean ridge, okay? So you can see different stages there. So the top stage is our example today is the Colorado Plateau. Our second one is the African Rift Valley. Our third one further down is the Red Sea. That's what's happening today. And lastly, our nice sort of mature ocean is the, North, or the Atlantic Ocean. And it's a sort of a sequence of events. And you can look forward through time and form a new ocean. And so. Here are our divergent plate margins. So the Gulf of California, we actually have divergence happening there. And we're creating new oceanic crust, new oceans. Then we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, is a nice, obvious sort of mature ocean. And then we have this really interesting area right now, which is the East African Rift. And it's over here. And you can see that there's sort of a line that runs down through here. And it encompasses these lakes as well. And that's where we're starting to form a new ocean. If we come back in sort of several million years or longer, what we'll see here will be a little ocean, a new little ocean basin in the middle here. And that's what the Red Sea is also doing. The Red Sea is a brand new little ocean. Okay. So here's our convergent boundaries. And a lot of it's what we've just talked about. The fact that here we have our ocean ocean. And there's a bit of a better diagram because you can see in the center there we have an ocean plate subducting, sliding underneath another ocean plate. And as it slides down and sinks back down into the mantle, there's melting just above it due to the release of water. 
and that magma, that molten magma, rises up and it forms this little chain, this linear chain of volcanoes um, along to the back of that. And we also get a trench where the, um, the two plates are meeting. Um, and so where do you think we can see where one on the map? So where do you think there's a nice line of volcanoes next to a really dark looking line next to a trench? Has anyone ever watched The Deadliest Catch? And is willing to admit to it? Yes, one at the back. Where, where do you think? <laughs> where are they based? Where do they go from? Alaska, absolutely. And they sail around what we call the Aleutian Islands. And it's a really miserable place to be on a fishing boat. But this little line of islands up here, this is a volcanic arc. And you can see that in front of those islands, we have a sort of a dark blue line like that. That's our trench. And then behind it, we have this little sort of paralleling that trench, we have this little line of islands. So that's where we have ocean, ocean crust uh, converging. Okay? So we've got the Aleutian Islands. We've also got the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest point on Earth. It's 36,000 feet below sea level, so further deep down than Everest is up. Um, and then we also have sort of other trenches along that side of the Pacific. Um, and this is a really cool cartoon from XKCD Comics, if you haven't seen this. And it shows the scale of the different oceans. So we've got the Great Lakes up at the top. And this is how deep that Marianas Trench is in comparison. It's really, really, really deep. And this is a really cool thing. Uh, it, you've got the link in your notes. And you can see how deep various different animals dive and, and how deep we've explored, things like that. It's very cool. OK, how much time have I got? Oh, I've got five more minutes. So here we have our ocean continent. And here, remember, we said we had our trench, where again, that ocean crust is starting to slide and subduct underneath the continent. So we have an ocean trench again, a really deep area of ocean. But then immediately on the land side of that, on the continent side, we have again a nice line of volcanoes. And instead of being a volcanic island chain, they're now just running along the, the edge of the continent. And does anyone have a good idea where there's a perfect example of this happening today? So looking at this map, where do you see a big line of mountains next to a really dark blue line showing a trench? Yeah. The, uh, maybe, which one's? The Andes. The Andes, absolutely. The Andes Mountains. And that's absolutely, it's our perfect example here. So the Andes, you can see that really dark line immediately next to the continent. That's our trench, that dark blue line. And then we've got that little line of mountains running all the way along the side of the continent. So the Andes are our perfect example of where we have this ocean crust subducting under continental crust, giving us uh, these particular landscape features. But also it's something that's happening in the, the US as well, under the Cascades. The reason that we have volcanoes like uh, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, is because we have subduction of ocean plate under the continent up there. So there we go. Um, and those subduction zones sort of really circle the Pacific. And that's, where we, that's why we call it the Ring of Fire, because those subduction zones are producing a lot of volcanic activity. And you can see that most of the volcanoes in the world are really concentrated around the edges of the Pacific, where we have that ocean plate subducting and sliding under either other bits of ocean plate or under the continents. Um, and so you can also see that those subduction zones are where we tend to get the biggest earthquakes. Those earthquakes are really huge when they go. Okay? And what else is associated with subduction zones and earthquakes that is very dangerous, as we have observed? Tsunamis, absolutely. Okay? So tsunamis, in particular, are generated at these subduction zones. Because what happens is that as those plates slide, or as this is our, my ocean plate sliding down, then this overlying plate gets bent down with it. And then all of a sudden, it slides back, and it shoots up like that, and it raises the seabed by several meters, if not tens of meters. And that shifts the whole overlying three kilometers of water 
up by several meters and the waves then shoot out in all directions. There's a little video there. Okay, we'll continue the rest on Friday. I'll see you then.